Faremos início agora ao nosso terceiro painel, cujo tema é o futuro da agricultura. E para proferir a apresentação desse tema, convidamos ao palco o Chairman e CEO da Bom Santo, Sr. Rio Grant, que muito nos honra com sua presença. Informamos a todos que esta palestra será toda em inglês. Aqueles que desejarem os fones de tradução simultânea, por favor, manifestem-se no local onde estão mesmo as nossas recepcionistas levarão os fones de tradução simultânea. Pedimos à mesa que, por gentileza, ilumine a plateia para que as recepcionistas possam visualizar aqueles que desejam os fones de tradução simultânea. Esse painel terá duração de 30 minutos. E como sabem, ao término da apresentação, os participantes poderão enviar suas perguntas por escrito ou fazê-las utilizando os microfones disponíveis no auditório. Os participantes que acompanham o evento via internet também poderão enviar suas perguntas através da página do Global Agrobusiness Forum no Facebook. Senhoras e senhores, com a palavra... Senhor Hill Grant. Good afternoon. It's my uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and the thousands of people who are listening and viewing uh, through Facebook and live streaming. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk about the future of agriculture. And as the ministers made the point in the last session, it's a very difficult thing to do. It's a very big, it's a very big subject. So let me begin with a small example that I think illustrates some of the future of agriculture. This, this was an example that my children brought home to me from school uh, many years ago and tonight when you go back home and people ask what happened at the global agricultural forum you can tell them that a guy with a Scottish accent cut his finger when he was slicing an apple so for this illustration this isn't an apple this is our earth this is the world And if you take the apple and you carefully, very, very carefully, you cut it into four and you discard three quarters. And these three quarters represent the oceans of our planet, the sea. And you take the quarter and you cut the quarter into two eighths, very carefully. <laughs> and you discard, you discard one eighth. And this eighth is the ice caps, it's the deserts, it's the swamps, and it's the world's mountain ranges. You're left, you're left with an eighth. And if you take the eighth and you cut it one more time, for the economists here, you'll be working, oops, you'll be working the fractions. If you take the, uh, the eighth and you cut it into four, I'll do it this way, you cut it into four thirty seconds. This is the most dangerous piece. Here we go, very carefully, oops, come sir. And you take these three 30 seconds and you discard these. And these are pieces of land that are too rocky, <laughs> they're too wet, they're too steep, or they're too cold, and you discard those. I did this in Europe, and a farmer said, you just talked about my farm. <laughs> so you discard those, and you're left with one thirty-second. And for the growers here, 
and the growers who are watching around the world online, all the food that we produce in the world today is grown in this one thirty-second. And if you take the thirty-second and you peel the skin of the apple, this is the same as the topsoil of the earth. It takes a hundred years to make an inch, a little more than half a centimeter. And if you don't manage it, you can lose it in one weekend. So for the earlier presentations today, which I thought were fantastic, it's true. We are approaching nine and a half to 10 billion people in the next 30 years. And 30 years, 35 years is an abstract. But for your grandchildren and for their children, we will produce nearly twice as much food on this 30 seconds. So when you think about the future of agriculture, I don't think the question is what. The, the future is clear. The question in the future of agriculture is how. How are we going to produce twice as much on the same small, thin piece of land? And how do we help growers worldwide do that? A big piece of the answer, I think, is um, here in the Americas, and increasingly here in Brazil. And I'll share very briefly with you some of my, uh, some of my thoughts. A, a few years ago, I was very fortunate. We had some guests that came to St. Louis, large growers from Brazil, from Argentina, from the US. And they spent nearly a week together talking with translators. And it was a wonderful experience because you could see the commonality in the exchange. And when you talk to them about the future and what were their thoughts about the future, there was three things that came up over and over again. Succession, who is gonna run the farm in the future? Financing, how can I afford to expand? How can I capitalize the farm? And the third one is innovation. Where will the future tools come from that will allow me to become more productive? Succession, financing, and innovation. I have to tell you, I, I believe the future is bright. I'm an optimist. If you're in agriculture, you need to be an optimist. I'm optimistic about the future. Innovation drives productivity. Innovation drives productivity and efficiency. And in tropical agriculture, new tools are even more important. 25 years ago, I was much younger, with a little bit more hair. <laughs> and I spent two weeks in the Sahados and spent the weekend in Rondonopolis. Rondonopolis then was a small town, and I watched young people having a beer, eating a slice of pizza. And when I go back now, I can't believe what has happened. And a piece of the future, I think, you see in what's happened in Rondonopolis in the last 25 years. Monsanto introduced Roundup Ready Soy. This isn't a talk about the past. It's easy to slip into the past. I think what's more interesting than Roundup Ready Soy is Intacta. And the reason Intacta is interesting is it was built, tested, developed, and launched in Brazil for Brazilian agriculture. And I think that's a glimpse of the future of agriculture. Developments will be developed locally but they need to be uh, globally, but they need to be integrated on a local level. Today, we are working on five research platforms. These platforms look at big issues, water, soil, drought, climate change. So those are global problems. 
And global problems need global solutions. I believe very strongly that agriculture, particularly agricultural research, needs to globalize more. And a piece of the future solution will be how does agriculture globalize more? Today, research and development is still very fragmented and very, very underfunded. We don't spend enough to solve the problems that face agriculture as we look into the future. In tropical agriculture, we need to accelerate the pace of research and development. We need new products faster, and we need to integrate tools between biology, chemistry, and data science. Growers need more help. The earlier presentation today was on, on uh, data science. I think data science is going to change agriculture in the next 20 years the way that biotechnology has changed it in the last 20. It will touch everything that we do in our lives, but it's going to have a fundamental impact for the better in agriculture. We will launch um, our data science programs in Brazil next year. And the beta testing this year, I think, has been very encouraging. So global challenges, water, soil, drought, climate change, need global solutions. But agriculture, as you can see, the spending is still fragmented. The underfunding has led to a slowdown in innovation. And there's, pro there's fewer products than there really should be when you consider the challenges that we face. So we haven't shifted fast enough to keep up. And I've felt this personally very strongly in the last few years. We announced last fall the merger between Bayer and Monsanto. Bayer will acquire Monsanto, and we believe that this deal will be finalized by the end of this year. You also see in our industry Dow DuPont and ChemChina Syngenta also consolidating. A big piece of this is driven by the need to accelerate innovation, to improve the speed and the delivery of new products. So it's about integrating technologies, chemistry and biology. It's about accelerating the delivery of new products. And I think also it's collaboration. Companies cannot do all of this on their own. So the shining example of Embrapa, the work with the land-grant universities in the US, these need to be more collaborative efforts going forward. So increased investment accelerates innovation. It drives innovation faster. For the grower, you say, what's in it for the grower? Pests and diseases in the future, I think, will be managed on a real-time basis. We'll have much more accurate data. And the decisions that growers make, the 30 to 40 decisions that a grower makes in establishing and harvesting a field of maize, those 30 to 40 interlinked decisions will be more data-driven than they ever have been before. So not what his or her neighbor does, not what his father does, not what he did last year, but what the data supports. And that's the shift that I think it will occur in agriculture. This will allow us, we talked about sustainability, I think it will allow us in agriculture to use less chemistry, to use chemistry more accurately, and to use chemistry before diseases and insects become a problem. In the US this year, we launched a product for nitrogen management, using the right amount of nitrogen at the right time in the areas of the field where the crop desperately needs it most. I think we see the evolution of that, where that will drive sustainable agriculture much faster. If you look at how we develop traits today, how we develop biotech traits, and the linkage between traits and chemistry, it's a sequential process. The traits are developed someplace, 
the chemistry is de developed another place, and the entire program takes 10 to 12 years. With the combination we bear, with the intimate link more and more between chemistry and biology, these processes will be developed in parallel. It will allow the grower to get new technologies faster, and it should increase the options that the grower sees. I mentioned earlier collaboration. There's no one company can do all this on their own. And as we think about the money that's invested today in agriculture, I think one of the key questions is, how do we select priorities? How do we work out those priorities between private and public partnerships? And then specifically, how do we measure progress over time? The work that Embrapa has done here, the land-grant universities in the US, sets a foundation, but this must be done faster and it must be done much more efficiently in the future. There's always a concern about what happens when companies come together. For 20 years, we have broadly licensed our technologies. So as we discover and develop, we license them broadly across the seed industry, not just here in Brazil, but worldwide. And at the closing of this deal, Bayer has confirmed that they will continue that practice of broad licensing so that everybody has the opportunity of access accessing these technologies. So I started with the apple. You remember the, uh, the 32nd, the tiny, little, uh, the tiny little slice. For all of us here, and all the different walks of agriculture, it all begins with this slice. It's a really simple example, but I think it underlines what we all have to do. If you think about the future from a farmer's point of view, very often they inherit the farm too late because dad doesn't want to let go. That's that succession thing. And then they have 20 or 30 harvests before they transfer the farm to the next generation. So when you think about this thin slice, for us involved in agriculture in the next 20 or 30 years, we need to work out how we can grow more with less water, less fertilizer, less chemicals, and protect this fragile soil. And when I think about the combination of Monsanto and Bayer, when I think about the opportunities in agriculture and the intensification of research and development, I'm very optimistic that as an agricultural community, we will achieve these goals. Obrigado. I think we're going to go to some uh, Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Hugh. It was an excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, nice I'm to see the lights up. It's <laughs> nice to see the <laughs> Thank audience. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions to you. Uh, of you. course. Uh, first of all, you saw in the previous panel a uh, presentation made by former minister Alison Paulinelli. Uh, he's perceived in Brazil to be the father of tropical agriculture. He even received the prize, the world the World Food Prize. Prize. Yes, for that. And uh, he lived uh, that whole story of building up the uh, expertise uh, which enabled the uh, conquering of the Cerrado. Yeah. Yeah. As a global businessman in agriculture, what's your view about the importance of tropical agriculture and whether this can be transferred as a demonstration effect? Yeah. to other nations in Africa, Southeast Asia, even Latin America. What's your view about this? And what's the future of tropical agriculture? Yes, that's good. That's four big questions in there. Um, 
I was in China last week. Uh, China looks to Brazil for a big piece of their agri agricultural production. So the importance of tropical agriculture is unquestioned. I think the real challenge is um, how do we stay ahead of rapidly evolving uh, insect challenges and rapidly evolving diseases. And the acceleration and the pace of that in uh, tropical agriculture is so much more challenging. And I am very pleased to be here today with uh, Mr. Polinelli. The, the next evolution of technology, I think, a great deal of it in tropical agriculture, will be the integration, the bringing together of separate technologies and using them in a much more intimate, specific way. So multiple applications of chemistry, but being much, much more targeted with those chemical applications. Having much deeper knowledge on not just the seed or the variety, but the genomics behind it. And the linkage between the genomics and the chemicals. And I think very soon also the microbiologicals. Soil is still very uh, understudied. And I think there's tremendous opportunities in using uh, microbiology and microbes as the first line of defense against seeds, particularly in, uh, particularly in tropical agriculture. Thank you very much. Um, another issue, and, and that's my personal perspective, uh, Hugh. I saw your company, Monsanto, um, uh, built up this entire transformation about seeds and, and, and the way I view is all about access. You enabled very um, deep technological items to become accessible across the board to farmers that farm either 200,000 hectares or very small, or very small two, five hectare, the same technology. So it's kind of, you, with this transformation, uh, knowledge in agriculture became more widespread and accessible widespread in seeds. Yep. And now we're moving towards a different uh, dimension of the digital agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I see it the same way. Digital agriculture is about access, access to information. And in the same way that the internet did for knowledge, and Google has done it yeah. for people to do research you know, of, about anything, digital agriculture will enable people to have access on data about climate, of uh, technologies for application of different sorts of crop protection inputs. Yeah. What's your view about this? Do you share this view? And, and how do you see this happening? Well, I'm very enthusiastic about uh, data science and the application of data in agriculture. And when you talk to growers, very often they say, hey, th this was a good harvest, but next year I'm going to change these three things. Next year is going to be better. That's the optimism in agriculture. The challenge is when you make 40 decisions that are linked it's very, very difficult to get it right every year. So the application of data to those decisions, I think, helps the grower. From a behavior point of view, this is going to drive collaboration on a totally different scale. Because to make those platforms work, you need chemistry. You need microbiology. You need to know as much as you can about the seed. You need to have fertilizer. You need the machinery companies, because the machinery companies are harvesting that data and populating that. So agriculture is often very fragmented. And I think for data science to work, we're going to have to bring all that data together. We need to manage privacy. We need to build trust. But this will be a collaborative effort. And I mentioned that the broad licensing earlier with uh, uh, bear in the future. I think these examples of opening up um, so that we have 
broad platforms that help the grower is going to be the, the, the foundation of this. It's going to be the key. But I'm, I, uh, I mentioned Rondonopolis 25 years ago. I think the data science change will come much faster. The, the speed of this is going to be much, much quicker. Thank you. And also, could you explain to us how the Bayer Monsanto deal uh, tackles and affects the development of tropical agriculture and digital ag. Yeah, so um, a piece is resourcing. Uh, so when we started uh, uh, Monsanto as a standalone agricultural company, we were spending about half a billion dollars a year. So we managed our cost, but we never backed off on our R&D. Um, this year, we will spend a billion and a half dollars, and it still isn't enough. And when we combine with Bayer, we'll be spending about two and a half billion dollars a year. So a piece of this is resources and focusing resources on key targets. Another piece of it is by combining the two companies, we get much faster. The, the example I gave on how you develop the trait, the gene, and the chemistry simultaneously, I think we shorten our timelines and we make this more efficient. And then finally with data science, we've been looking for some time on how do you bring chemistry onto that platform and this jump starts that, that gives us that first rapid evolution. So I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm very excited to see the developments in the next three to five years that come from this combination. I think you must have that feeling that most uh, people here in this room and outside of the room who are following in the internet or the platforms, digital platforms, have of anxiety, of not of putting your head uh, rest on bed <laughs> and being excited about uh, what you have to do next day. Absolutely. And, uh, That's the great thing about agriculture, I think. There's always the next day, you know. And we can only thank you, Hugh, for spending time to come here and attend GAF Talks. I'm very honored to be here. Um, I salute you for the, the organization. I think it's fantastic that you do a meeting dedicated to agriculture. And I'd just like, in, in conclusion, uh, Minister uh, Roberto Rodriguez talked about communication in the whole area of biotechnology and in the future in data science. As a community, we, we need to do a better job in communicating what agriculture does. And I think forums like this really help in that communication. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Os nossos agradecimentos ao senhor Rio Grande, Dr. Plínio Nastari, que participaram deste painel.